This interview is with Dr. Paul Cruikshank, a St. Andrews physicist. We talk about what makes the perfect music gig, what he expected more of in academia, and his experiences with hair dye in the past and possibly the future. Enjoy listening. You're listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Avery. Join us as we journey into the lives of St. Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations, and motivations. So today on Insight, we're interviewing Dr. Paul Cruikshank, a physicist here at St. Andrews. Thanks for joining us. You're more than welcome. So could you tell us a bit about your positions here at St. Andrews? So I am currently a lecturer, open bracket, education focused, close bracket um, <clears throat> in the department and have been since early 2010. Um, I've been at St. Andrews, well, more specifically physics and astronomy at St. Andrews, more or less forever. I came here uh, straight out of school. Um, in 1995, and then did uh, an MSci degree, which doesn't exist anymore, sort of morphed into the MPhys um, with the addition of a few credits. And then I did a PhD here, and then I was a postdoctoral researcher um, up until I got this teaching job. Okay, so can you tell us a bit about your research then? Is it all so, education focused? Uh, so I don't really do that much research anymore. <laughs> at all actually um, so my research before I got the teaching job was uh, on millimetre wave instrumentation specifically for magnetic resonance um, and working with uh, Graham Smith um, in the same group that Dave McFarland's in actually um, so that was uh, constructing a, a 94 gigahertz uh, electron spin resonance spectrometer um, and I worked on that for possibly a surprisingly long time, actually, given that it's one instrument. I was working on that for about seven years, um, mostly writing software. Um, well, mostly writing software bugs, to be fair. Um, <coughs> and a, and a, a bit of the optical design and stuff um, and that as well. Um, my position now is really into almost entirely teaching only. Um which I like, actually. I like teaching, which is, which well, is why I applied for this job. <laughs> That's good, though. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's not always necessarily a given. Um, people people end up in, 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 in whatever job they're doing, I think, almost largely by, by accident. Um, so I, I was fortunate that at the time I was trying to decide what I wanted to do longer term because a postdoc isn't a career option. I was fortunate that a number of UK physics departments were taking on teaching fellows, as we were called back then. Um, so at the time I was looking around, deciding I wanted to do teaching, it so happened that, that these jobs were going. So so all worked out in the end. Yes, yes. Seven years on one project, that must have been a, a satisfying conclusion. Well, the goalposts kept moving. <laughs> um, uh. So it took... Um, there was a substantial engineering effort in, in that particular instrument. Um, so it took a few years before we were at the stages of even having the first wiggly line. Um, and then it, 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 it took a few more years to get it to semi-finished state. Um, and then, you know, Graham, who I was working for at the time, kept coming up with, oh, it'd be nice if it could do this. It'd be nice if it could do this. It'd be nice if it could do this. Um, and that's probably fairly typical, actually. <laughs> As, as these things work, as, as, um, as soon as you've got something, people always want something a little bit more sophisticated or that does a slightly different type of experiment. Okay, and did you have a favourite thing about magnetic resonance that drew you to that field of study? Um, no. <laughs> not, not, not particularly. It was more, it was a project that was on the go or starting when I finished my PhD, I was more always more interested in the instrumentation, actually. So this is just one application of these high frequency microwave techniques. Um, I mean, the particular instrument, if you put 
an antenna on the end of it and pointed it out of the window, you'd actually have a fairly high resolution pulsed radar, um, even though the application is really, really different. Uh, so I was more always more interested in the instrumentation. Um, it requires biochemists and, and and biologists to actually make any sense of what the wiggly lines coming out of the the spectrometer actually mean. So um, somebody like Janet Lovett, for example, um, would have way more idea of of what the spectra that you get out of these things actually means. So I can build you an instrument that will collect data. Um, I would then ask someone else to tell me what the data actually means. And what is the most satisfying part about people using it? Is it is it the practical applications of it, or do you think that I, the I, depth of knowledge is, is more satisfying? Um, so my enjoyment is always kind of the building side of these things. But at the end, it's always nice when someone else, particularly someone else in an area that I don't really understand, reckons that the instrument produces something useful so that particular instrument we've sold one and a half copies um to one and a half state. yeah people always ask the one and a half so um we sold a complete copy to the national high magnetic field lab um in the u.s uh, which is in tallahassee in florida and another national facility bought a copy of the optical system so they put their own electronics in it essentially but bought the optics or bought a copy of the optics not directly from us because we don't make the optics but there's a uh, a company um we designed it so there's a company in the south of england um, called thomas keating who uh, are kind of the go-to guys if you want to buy millimeter wave instrumentation um so they make the they made the horn antennas um, on the Planck mission, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah, so all this kind of microwave, uh, really high-end microwave engineering. Um, so a lot of space. They do a lot of space stuff. Um, and there's overlaps with that in other projects that universities are carrying out. Then yeah, for yeah, design, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what's something you thought you'd do more of in academia? Travel or meeting more people or seeing work's impact? Maybe. I think if you'd asked me years before I ever started doing much teaching, I would have thought that I would, as someone who is primarily a, a lecturer in the literal sense of the word, um, I thought I would spend more time actually lecturing. Um I didn't appreciate how much effort it takes to get one hour or 50 minutes, you know, five past the hour to five mm -hmm. to the next yep. hour, how much effort it takes to get 50 minutes of reasonably coherent content prepared. So less behind the scenes work, as it were. And yes. More kind of and on more, stage. more FaceTime is, is probably what I thought was involved. Okay, and do you ever see anyone else's research and get envious? Like, especially all the time. Teaching. Yeah, no, no, all the time. Particularly now that I don't do so much. Um, do you ever look across and say, "I wish I was researching high power laser beams"? Or? Uh, not lasers, actually. I did. My degree <laughs> was well. When I signed up for it, it was called laser physics and optical electronics, um, and that sounded cool, which is kind of why I chose it. Um, by the time I graduated, the university changed the name to physics with photonics um but the main conclusion i came to at the far end of that process was that if i never saw another laser in my life it would be a billion years too soon i i just don't really care that much about this <laughs> um so so in the particular case of high power lasers no i've never felt envious of people doing that but no very often i look at other research things that people in the school are doing and think, oh, that, that looks really cool. Um, but you've never applied for a summer internship? <laughs> not not since getting my job, no. That makes sense. I, I'm not sure the Student Staff Council will look terribly kindly in an application. I, I, think, I think I would be worried if uh, yes, yes. <laughs> staff were in the application. So I, I, did, I did internships back in the day when I was in a position to do them at home. But no, I mean, there, there is, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. 
Um, and probably a bit more varied than when I was an undergraduate in the department as well. Um, the, the department was a lot more lasers heavy, actually, uh, when I was an undergraduate. Um, probably, I don't know, a, a good two thirds of the research effort. Was, and and that branching out is good to see. Yeah, and it, so the, there's a lot more variation now, I think, than there was. At what point did you first consider yourself a scientist? Um, I'm, I'm not terribly convinced that I would be terribly comfortable claiming myself to be a scientist even now. Um, but I think I wanted to consider myself a scientist from a fairly young age. Um, so uh, probably before the end of primary school. And then did you ever turn around one day and say, I am a physicist now? Like, if you had, had your degree or So when, when year people ask me or... what I do, I say I'm a physicist, but it kind of depends who you're talking to, right? Because um, if you meet somebody at a party and, and they're not a historian, then you might feel inclined to call yourself a physicist. Um, but when you're surrounded by other physicists, you're not, you know, maybe a little bit more wary of claiming the privilege. Um, I would still probably claim to be more an aspiring or learning physicist than an actual physicist. Um, you spend, uh, as your career progresses, you spend more time learning less um, in terms of the, the kind of breadth of your field. Um, particularly when there's always so much new stuff going on around you, you feel that the percentage of physics that you're on top of is shrinking all the time, right? Because there's all this new stuff, whether it's genuinely new or it's only you're only finding out about it because someone has arrived with this particular research interest and they're talking about stuff you've never thought about before. So kind of a, an awareness of ignorance is yeah, exactly. Yes, humble, absolutely. You yes, know. you're just you're just enumerating your ignorance in a little bit more detail as time goes on. Interesting. So if you could have studied another subject then instead of physics, what would that have been? I toyed with the idea of doing electronic engineering um, to the stage of writing it down in my UCAS form um, uh, for, I can't remember where it was, one of the places anyway I applied for, for electronic engineering because um, I was always interested in electronics as well. Um, so that would be the obvious choice. In terms of things I think I should have studied more, I kind of regret that on my way through my undergraduate degree, I stopped doing dedicated maths modules kind of as early as I was allowed to and regretted that a little bit, um, particularly comparing myself with Dav McFarlane, actually, who you've also interviewed in this series, um, because we went through our PhDs together in the same group and we did our degrees at the same time. And because he did theoretical physics, he had to do a few more maths modules than I had to do. And subsequently in our PhDs was always better at the maths bits um, than I was. So I kind of regret not doing a little bit more maths than I, than I actually did. Okay. That's kind of different from wishing I'd done it as a subject because I don't. But yes, it would have been good uh, for me. <laughs> it's a, a very marked difference. Is there a specific job you would have wanted to have gone into if you didn't go into academia? Um, retrospectively, medical physics. I think if I had maybe thought a bit more widely regarding what I wanted to do at the end of my first degree, medical physics would have been something I would have at least considered. So I think medical In a very research-heavy capacity? Um, yeah, probably. I, I don't think I'd want to be a medical physicist. Um, I don't think I interact with other people well enough for that. <laughs> so medical physics, but without the people. Um, you've been in St Andrews a considerable length of time. So what is it about here that you like then? There's presumably something if you did your um, I like here. I like the department. Um, and it's... Probably, I, I probably feel more rooted in the department than, than university as a whole. Um, and I think, well, I think quite a few of our current students would, would probably recognise that sentiment in that um, no matter how one feels about the, the broader institution, um, the department is a very nice, friendly, collegiate place to be. Um, that makes it may sound more negative about the broader institution than, <laughs> than, than, than I'm comfortable being billed as. But um, 
But as an undergraduate here, I kind of always felt I belonged more to the department than the university because the department is quite self-contained. You, um, It's a bit out of the way of the centre of the town as well. So yes, you kind of feel yeah, very much yeah. in the physics department. Yeah. I probably didn't choose to stay here for my PhD for the best of reasons. I'm probably guilty of just making a comfortable choice because I knew the place. But it kind of panned out okay because... You know, I, I enjoyed my PhD um, and I quite like working here. Uh, the department's <laughs> changed a lot in the time it's I've been two here. two good things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The department's actually changed a lot in the time I've been here. The The makeup of the, the staff is probably a lot more international than it was um, and a bit broader in terms of the, the different research interests as well. More students, uh, much more international makeup of students. Um, it felt very Scottish when I was an undergraduate here in the department. I think I can't remember what the numbers were, but um, not that many international students in physics at that time. But it's great to see now. Oh yeah, no, no, ab- absolutely. Yeah, so I think it's a nicer place to be than it was. Um, it was always a, for me a comfortable place to be, but I think it's probably a better one. And you get a broader experience of people. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, that's good. Um, do you ever consider living elsewhere or are holidays enough for you? So I don't live in the town anymore. I haven't for some time because, well, nobody can afford to buy a house in St Andrews. Um, so I live uh, I live about half an hour west um, and it's quite a nice place, small village in Fife. I mean, Fife in general, or this, this bit of Fife is a very nice place to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never particularly thought about going anywhere else um i guess if circumstances presented themselves then then one might have to um it's not terribly fashionable in academia to to stay in one place um for such a, a continuous length of time so have you ever played in a band yes um i have played in uh, a couple of bands Oh, excellent. Can you tell us some stage names? or? Yeah, bands? so the first one was called Magic Pants. And, um, oh my God, it was it was awful. Elton John covers. And, oh dear, dear. And with dear. a name like Magic Pants, it sounds so promising. Yeah, well, we, we had a reasonable following, mainly due to the charisma of the guy that sang for us. Uh, 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 an extremely... An extremely friendly, chirpy chap um, who, you know, was very engaging and, and a good singer and stuff. And I I used to skulk in the back wearing one of my selection of, of heavy metal T-shirts. We, we had a, a review in a now defunct news, student newspaper um, which said that the bass player was wearing a clearly ironic Sepultura t-shirt, and there was nothing ironic about it. <laughs> I was just wearing my my, my favourite Sepultura t-shirt. Um, yeah, that that was pretty awful, actually. Um, but then, around the oh, I'm getting on for about ten years ago, I was in a band composed entirely of people who worked in the physics building, actually. Um, our, the clean room technician at the time and uh, a guy who was working in Kishin Delacue's group and a guy who was doing his PhD um, also in Graham Smith's group and um, they vetoed the name Band Gap sadly um, <laughs> which I that is thought was deeply hilarious oh. um, we were we were reasonably regular for, for a couple of years that was good fun cheesy pub rock there was nothing terribly exciting about it but um it was good fun oh that does sound good I'm sad i've missed that no no chance of it getting back together we do occasionally um reunion tour uh we had a very short reunion tour we did a two-day a two-day world tour last summer and we played clayton caravan park which is about four miles towards dersey and we played aikman's um Yes, so sometimes when the guys come up. Covered all bases there. Yes, yes, all the important, <laughs> all the important bits. 
Fantastic. So you've mentioned uh, concerts and mosh pits in your lectures. How many do you estimate you've gone to? Um, so it's something that I started relatively late in life because St Andrews is an awful place to go to if you want to enjoy music scene, particularly if you don't learn to drive until you're 25. Um, that would do it, yeah. So I didn't really start going to that many gigs um, until I had a bit of disposable income, actually. Um, so the the first sort of proper, as a non-student band pub gig I went to um, was a band called The Dodgy, who had a one-hit wonder called Staying Out for the Summer in 1995, and they played the union here in a freshers' week a few years later, once they were sufficiently obscure that, well, effectively, the union could afford to book them. The first gig that I would own up to off uh, on the record oops it's um, on the record was was uh, Roger Taylor I went to see um, in maybe 1999 in the garage in Glasgow and that was fantastic so I've probably only been to a couple of dozen sort of proper gigs over the years actually because um, most of the time these bands as Glasgow is the closest to get to here well plenty of time for a catch up yes what, what for you makes a great concert then um there's a few things. So I can, I, I've, I've been to uh, gigs by all the, all of what I would say were my favourite bands. Um, and they've all been great when you really know the songs. My What I think was probably the best one was uh, Napalm Death a few years ago. And I went to see them because, primarily because they were on the same bill as um, as my favourite metal band. Um, but they were they they, they did a, a much better show. Just the kind of the energy and 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 um and enthusiasm. Enthusiasm kind of undersells it actually, because you have to kind of see one of these things to, to to appreciate what 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 the mood's like. Um, the one of the most impressive gigs I went to was ACDC in uh, about two thousand or two thousand and one. Um, and at the time, I wasn't terribly familiar with their back catalogue, actually. I went because uh, somebody had pulled out um, you know, a group of friends who were going, so I got the ticket at the last minute. Um, but what was fantastic about that was you could tell that they'd been doing the same thing every night for the last 30 years because it was just absolutely no perfect. Um, it was also kind of amusing that they had a roadie come on in between songs to towel off the sweat from the lead guitarist on the stage. That um, sounds a glamorous job. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm guessing it was everything he dreamed of. Um, <laughs> so going to see a performance by people who've been doing it for a long time and are really, really good at it is is quite an awesome thing. And and who don't appear to be bored by the fact that they're doing the same thing that they've done that, for the that last thirty years. Desirable, yeah. Um, when you come out of some big show with amazing production values and you're on, I don't know, tour date seventeen out of eighty five or something, but it still feels like they just organised it just for you. Um, that that's always quite impressive. And and one of the good things about being quite keen on dinosaur rock bands is. Um, you get good, you know, good production values. Um, Ramstein was quite notable in terms of the amount of things that they set fire to, um, in, including themselves, um, which was quite impressive. ACDC was probably the loudest one. Um, I say, no, it was the second loudest one. Motorhead was the loudest one. That was like having my head in a blender. So, so a number of factors then, ranging from enthusiasm to practice to uh, fire. Yes. Makes a yes. concert. Do you have a favourite venue? Not really. Um, I've not really been to so many gigs that I've that there's a particular venue I've been over and over and over. I have a non-favourite venue. The I think it's called the Academy in Glasgow. It has such terrible acoustics that when I went to see Megadeth there in two thousand and five, I had to ask on more than one occasion the friend I went with what song they were playing when they started because it was just a wall of noise that doesn't um, sound great 
Nice. Are you are you a one genre man? Is it rock and metal? I guess that's two. Or or do you like an eclectic mix? In terms of what I spend my money on buying, I'm probably fairly narrow minded in in rock and metal. Um, that's not one genre. There are many yeah. genres of of death metal alone. There's doom death metal and death doom metal, and they are different. Um, <laughs> no offense intended. Yes. So I don't. Um, there are a few musical genres that I object to. There's not many things that I would <laughs> what bother my RC enough to. to. <laughs> well, I don't really object to anything. There are not many things that I would, you know, go to the effort of standing up, walking across a room and switching off. Um, except for Billy Joel. But that's not really his fault. I had a, a Saturday job working for my uncle's butcher shop when I was about 15 and Radio 2 was on constantly and um, this was back in the days when before Radio 2 became kind of a little bit newer and exciting so you'd hear River of Dreams um, almost guaranteed at least three times by the time you got only halfway through the afternoon Um, so I developed an irrational hatred of, of River of Dreams um, so you have a least favorite genre then, but that's not B- Billy really Joel, Billy Joel's no fault. For, oh, fault of his own. Yeah, absolutely. Have you met any of your music heroes? No, actually, no, I, 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 I sadly not. Well, there we go. We can, something, something to aspire to. And can you name a favorite song and band? My favorite band is a Liverpudlian death metal outfit called Carcass. Um, Cherry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, They build themselves as the second most influential band to ever come out of Merseyside. Um, I think whether you agree with that or not depends on how big a half-man, half-biscuit fan you are. Um, I'm not going to name my favourite song by them because they're they're fairly antisocial in terms of their their lyrical content. (laughs) They did have a concept album. Um, Well, I'm not sure they would describe it as such, but their one of one of their their better regarded works is effectively a concept album about uses for dead bodies um it's all very wow. tongue in cheek um it's all very tongue in cheek and do well do you have another favorite song that you do care to mention so i'm a big queen fan as well good so, choice um, I'm a why big... wouldn't you be <laughs> yes because brian may is, is is an amazing guitarist um i saw them last year actually well half of them um given that that John Deacon hasn't played with them for quite some time now, and obviously Freddie Mercury died a um, long, long time ago now. Um, so, I'm a, yeah, I'm a big Queen fan. Um, my favourite Queen song is probably the Prophet song, um, which is one of the album tracks of A Night at the Opera. Um, and it, the same album which is most famous for being the one that's got Bohemian Rhapsody on it um, but the Prophet Song is a beautifully intricate multi-multi-tracked affair which to quote um, Classic Rock magazine um, makes uh, Bohemian Rhapsody sound like the Ramones so so if you thought Bohemian Rhapsody was, was multiple layered then um, this one's much better That's one to check out then. And also the the guitar solo in Brighton Rock is, is quite amazing, um, where he, he plays in harmony with himself by use of a delay pedal. Um, and back when it was recorded, it was probably an analogue delay. Well, it would have had to be an analogue delay pedal. They didn't have digital delay in, in 1975 um, so you had a loop of tape going around and you had a read head and a, or a, a playing head and a record head um, and by varying the speed of the of the tape you varied how big a delay you got Oh that's a pretty neat way of doing things um, Do you have any other hobbies? Uh, so I'm quite keen in photography um, keen being more important than good um, in the interest of accuracy 
Um, I liked, particularly like taking photographs of plants, mainly because they are easier than wildlife. <laughs> so they don't move quite so fast. Well, every year I um, every year I go to the Isle of May to take photographs of puffins. Um, wildlife in general, I don't really care about, and all birds more or less look the same to me, except puffins. Puffins are um, sufficiently different that I can tell them from seagulls. Um, and I will go there and I'll try and take pictures of puffins in flights and I'll take 1,200 photos and then maybe eight will be in focus. And of those eight, maybe one will be reasonably well composed. Whereas with plants, you have the luxury that the buggers aren't flying for a start, or rarely anyway. Um, and particularly orchids. Um, but given that wild orchids <laughs> in Scotland um, or the interesting wild orchids aren't that easy to find. Um, that tends to be botanic gardens, which is even better because then you don't even have the wind blowing them around. So I, I'm quite keen on photography. Oh, uh, that sounds lovely. Um, you help teach programming using Arduino chips to students within the school, but do you have any at-home projects uh, for programming or Arduino that you like to work on? I've had a few. Um, I've, I... Built a a couple of small gadgets. Nothing terribly exciting, actually. No, I know, internet connected fridges or anything like that. Um, I built a little thing to trigger a flash to take photographs of falling droplets, and you could set adjustable timings and stuff. Um, and but nothing that exciting. Um, I've got a kid now and I don't have time to do any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, speaking of running out of time, we're going to move on to the quick fire round. So you can try <laughs> answer these uh, relatively quick, but feel free to expand upon your answers if you want. So do you have a favourite non-academic book? So I have a, a, a few favourite novels all by the same person. Um, uh, a sadly now deceased uh, Fife author called Ian open bracket, M, close bracket, Banks. Um, I'm quite keen on, on a number of his novels. Um, in terms of reading, I much prefer fiction to non-fiction, actually, because um, I spend a lot of time reading textbooks. Um, and good textbooks I will derive some enjoyment of. <laughs> Shout out to Horowitz and Hill, The Art of Electronics, um, the third edition. The earlier ones aren't terribly readable. The third edition is quite readable. Third time's the charm. Um, do you have a favourite movie? Yes, <laughs> Aliens. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Alien, of the Alien series. I am very unsophisticated when it comes to film tastes. It's guns and explosions. Best way to do it. Yeah. Um, have you ever dyed your hair? Yes, I had a purple Mohican for a while. A purple Mohican. Um, would you, if your students requested it? Would they dye it? Well, I'd have to grow it first, I suppose. You could just grow it. I could dye my beard. beard. Yes, yeah. yes. Pantera's. Um, if, if we get petitions going around. Beer. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a petition in your, your door next week, you realise. Uh, what's the longest you've ever let your hair grow? I, uh, down to about here, he says, gesturing in a, <laughs> a way that makes absolutely no sense um, for audio. Uh, just below shoulder length, about shoulder length. Uh, do you have a favourite animal? Is it puffins? <laughs> or do the, the photography trips make them less liked than another animal you don't need to photograph? No, I, yeah, puffin would probably do. It's not something given. I'm quite partial to herons, actually. I like herons. <laughs> so that's two. Do you prefer lemons or oranges? Uh, lemons. What is your drink of choice when at the pub? Um, uh, uh, wheat beer. Um, a particular, German, particular Belgian, brand? Uh, not that fussy. <laughs> De Koning was quite partial to. You can't, can't get that in St Andrews very easily anymore. Um, I'm quite partial to Leff as well. I think my finest academic moment actually was winning a poster prize in a conference in Antwerp. And the prize was 85 euros in cash. So I went to the bar afterwards and said, 15 Leff, please. Um, not all for me, I have to hasten to add. 
Um, but yes, I'm quite partial to, to Belgian wheat beer. What do you consider to be your most annoying habit? I have a, a tendency to retell people the same anecdotes over and over and again with absolutely no memory of the fact that I've ever told them this before. Now, it's fine if you don't meet them again, but I guess for close no, friends no, and no, family, it's a more of an issue. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, have you ever performed in a theatre production or a school play? I So I was... 18 ferret in a school production of Toad of Toad Hall, um, which I think was the the drama guy's way of telling me that <laughs> I didn't deserve anything more substantial. And I also played the doctor in a school production of Oliver a few years later, um, which I had lines. I, I One of them was, I'll eat my head. Um so if you'd stuck at it, who knows where you'd be today? Absolutely. You know, from yeah. ferret to doctor, it's, it's on the way up. Indeed. Um, who would you want to narrate your life? Ryan Atkinson. <laughs> in, in Mr. Bean or with his actual voice? Um, more, I was, I'm thinking more Blackadder, actually. That sounds like it would be pretty good. Although I think I, as my, I would like to think I'm Blackadder, but really I'm more Baldrick. <laughs> in the way that lots of physicists would like to think that they're Leonard, but are probably closer to Sheldon. Um, so, um, but it's better than Howard, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, finishing question: uh, What do you find as the most rewarding thing in your life? Whether it's in music or academia or family or so, I've got a toddler, and I find interacting with her pretty rewarding, actually. And I guess when you've got a kid, you are obliged to say that you've got a kid. Um, <laughs> but but actually, probably that. Oh, that's lovely. Fatherhood. Oh, the good I, bits of fatherhood. <laughs> the good bits. Selective fatherhood. Well, I think that's a great place to end. So thanks for joining us once again, Dr. Paul Krugshank. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, you're very welcome. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I was your host, Samuel Avery. Thanks to all the wonderful academics of St. Andrews. Join us in the future as we learn more of the people making our education. This podcast was produced by myself and our publicity officer, Connor McBride. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, please find us on Facebook or Google St. Andrews Physics Society for our website. Goodbye.